to our book talk uh, lecture series. This is a special book talk uh, lecture today that we are having, uh, hosting. Uh, my name is Jisoo Kim. I am the director of the GW Institute for Korean Studies and the Korean Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Languages and Literatures. Uh, we are very delighted to um, have Dr. Ko with us today to give her book talk. Um, let me uh, introduce Dr. Ko before I invite her to the podium. Um, Dr. Uh, Dongyoung Ko is an art critic and has served as a mentor and committee member in art residences uh, and museums in South Korea over the last two decades. She's also currently an adjunct, faculty, adjunct lecturer at Seoul National University. Um, and she was the commissioner of the Koyan Outdoor Sculpture Festival and served as uh, the managing committee of AOT Cinema and Media Festival. Um, and uh, she has also published more than 40 academic essays um, in journals, uh, as well as she also has book publications. Um, and one of uh, some of the recent uh, book publications include From Soft Power to Goods Alternative Forms of Exhibitions and Populist Artistic Practices in Post 1990s East Asian Art, published by Seoul. Uh, Press 2018 and the condition for art criticism published by the same press 2019 and uh, more recently Korean War and Post Memory Generation the Arts and Films in South Korea published by Routledge 2021 which is going to be the focus of her talk today all right so without further ado let me invite Dr. Ko my name is Dong Young Ko and uh, I definitely uh, was really grateful of the Institute, as well as the uh, audiences to have a chance to ch a chance for me to introduce about my books. The book is a uh, theoretical book targeted for uh, graduate school students. That in this talk, I kind of more um, bring general perspective about how artists and filmmakers in post-war generations uh, react to those circumstances and which um, and. I really introduced the 13 artists and filmmakers. Korean War has been listened, gotten attention of the American public, certainly compared to the one preceding, like a second world war and one following, such as the Vietnam War. And the, the contexts are a bit different, but contemporary Koreans are equally least mindful of Korean War. The exhibition at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Korean Art on the right, as you can see, uh, in Korea has also undermined the historical circumstances, circumstances directly related to the Korean War. It rushes to underscore the piece at the end of the exhibition, of, uh, filling more, more than half of the spaces with the works of famous artists, such as Ai Weiwei, Chinese artists, work on the Syrian refugees. So it really represents the Korean War as a kind of universal, in relation to the universal human conditions. I will cite the poor liqueur, the French philosopher, in memory, history, and forgetting. Liqueur famously, famously puts it that the verb forgetting designates the unperceived character of the perseverance of mem memories and their removal from vigilance of consciousness. In a way, the liquor uh, noted the interdependent relationship between remembrance and forgetting. I'd like to say there's some over tendency to downplay the treacherous nature of the uh, Korean War. Indeed, Korean War continued to be the subject of people's interest at least among the countries that had participated in the war, you can see the different representations. One of the lot is uh, the poster of the films in North uh, Korea during the 1970s. One in the middle on the left is an image of uh, the memorials at Washington nearby. And the third one is the film Take of Giving a Union, blockbuster film made in South Korea in 2004. On the right is the most recent one, very controversial one, the film Battle at the Shangjin. So the Korean War uh, is remembered, and it is a consistent subject of controversy. It is forgotten as it distorts the reality of um, uh, the war, 
only celebrating the heroic deeds of the Chinese armies against definitely their enemies at that time is the UN troops led by uh, the United States militaries. So I will pay attention to the Korean War for its ambivalent status to further explain how it can be both remembered and forgotten. Let me explain um, the more about this unique conditions. I believe that kind of more prone to both remembrance and oblivion versus Korean War has not ended. We're still in the shadow of truth. So we can't simply forget it. But at the same time, it has ended seven years ago. So contemporary Korean society can't not keep on just kind of bombarded with this fear. So they have to forget some part of it in order to invest and prosper and to move on. So there's a kind of contradiction there. At the same time, if you know the Korean history, there is a huge and long history of anti-communist social uh, atmosphere, which kind of silenced about a lot of the historical details, such as civilian massacre executed during the Korean War. So every balance of Korean War corresponds to the dual state of the post-memory generation in Hirsch's theory, I will bring up later. The post-memory generations inherited the memory represent both closeness and distance from the tragic memory of the older generation because the post-memory concept emphasized the next generation who interest in the Korean War try to get in close with this tragic memory. So there's a closeness on the one hand, but at the same time, it has ended. So it's inherited memories. They can only access to the historical treasury through secondary sources just as a blockbuster movies or the stories inherited within the family. So there's a distance. So I consider the unique conditions for the Korean War have, can be an interesting subject matter for the study of personal memory. This is the, the book cover image, and these are the themes that I will deal with. So remembrance and forgetting, past and present, truth and imaginary investments, and generation and gaps, empathy and psychological distance out of the post-memory generations. And I haven't had a chance to have a talk at the graduate schools, and I explained that as I was writing this book, I began to realize that this kind of post-memory and inherited concept of memory can be really common to all, because I, well, when I was writing, I just began to remind myself about the whole stories that my grandfather or grandmother had passed on to me. And it's, it's not really specific about any diplomatic condition. It's really about how the lot of uh, the modern nation had undergone and the old families and or relatively their own history of wars and treasury. So I think it, it's really a good way to think about your own family as well. This is a table of content. Uh, first uh, part is about the theoretical background of post-memory generation. And I will bring up this uh, specific historical and cultural circumstances in South Korea in the section two. And in the third section, I will bring up the 13 great artists and filmmakers. I asked them to join it, but this is really nighttime in South Korea. Uh, but please let me just name all these peoples because these are artists not just Deal, dealt with uh, Korean War. They are happen to be the very famous artists in South Korea. Two or three of them actually presented uh, a Korean pavilion at Venice Biennial. And Hong Sun Im, for instance, get the, the second, I mean, the biggest surprise from Venice Biennial. So Hong Sun Im, Won Jin Che, all these uh, artists, I, you know, I will mention about them. This is the book cover of Marion Hirsch's Post Memory. I mean, there's a lot of the traditions who talked about post-memory, but I will mention this about the Hirsch. Let me read the Hirsch's very famous quote. Post-memory is a powerful form of memory precisely because its connection to its object or source is mediated not through recollection, but through representation, projection, and creation. I was, I was drawn to this concept of imaginary investment namely arts and writing by the post memorization is intended to have this exposure to imaginary investment. 
because uh, they can, the post memory generation can only access to the history of war through the secondary sources. Uh, therefore, it's a, a it's very valuable uh, and, and gives a great explanatory framework for arts and films created both those who never personally witnessed historical tragedies. So there's a particular historical circumstances for the post memory generation uh, to, to talk about the history of war. And the other thing is the one can say that the generations born after the historic tragedies had a relatively least burden of being strictly truthful. It's also important to note that the art is certainly the area that is more open to individual and personal interpretations of historical material, certainly in comparison to history or politics. This is, there's another good aspect of why we kind of wanted to bring up the post memory and to think about how the generations after, after this traumatic events have actively pursue and explore those issues of treasury without really directly experiencing them. In order to see the more detailed characterization among the post memory generation in South Korea, I refer to Chang Wen Cho, the director of unification research at um, Aji University. He cited the three categories, and this is like grew up, that means it's not born, but rather they were born right before this year, or they were, um, uh, uh, raised or grew up in, um, and spent some time in their 10 teens or 20s, well, uh, around some of the interesting historical events that had taken place. And throughout 1953, the oldest generation can be considered to be like a first generation or 1.5 generation in Hirsch's theory. This first generation is the generation who experienced the war. And 1.5 generation is the generation who witnessed the war but cannot have a full memory of that because they were just born right before the 1953. And the second generation is grew up in 1987. This particularly 1987 is the, uh, something related to the democratization movement that took place in 1980. And 1987 is famous for the June uh, 29th announcement, which considered to be the success outcome of the democratization movement. So I kind of pay attention to the second generation. These are the post-memory generation because they haven't really experienced the Korean War. But at the same time, this is the generation that developed a very strong critical historical consciousness because they had under uh, when the uh, democratization movement. So at that time, historical representation in other words, how you understand the modern Korean history and the birth of Korea as a nation becomes so controversial issue. So that I really pay attention to this middle generation. Most of the artists uh, in the book were born in late 1960s until early 1980s. So they're like a little bit younger generation of this you know, middle generation. And the third generation is the the youngest one who grew up in 2019. I think it's just uh, the research was uh, which was taking place around this time. So that means just to simply say youngest generation. Uh, they have a very different opinions. I was involved with some of the young artists collective who are dealing with the image of a Korean division or something. Uh, basically, the, they consider the North and South Korea as a separate. So the obsessing with unification is not the really uh, the perceivable resolution of the current state of a division. But at the same time, they have less interest in historical memories themselves. themselves. So I uh, consider that the second middle generations might be the most interesting uh, subject for me as well as I belong to this second generation. And then I will talk about some of the historical background for artists and filmmakers. Uh, this is the image of Jeju Peace Park. You know, the Jeju April 3rd instance, one of the earliest communist hunt-down that played, that took place in 1947 and 48, right before the Korean War. And some scholars had intended to consider that as the prelude to the Korean War. And what happens during the uh, late 1990s and 2000 is that the 
a civil even civilian Korean government began to establish the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, to which uh, the government really undertook serious investigation of the, some of the civilian massacre that took place during the Korean War, and that includes the, uh, the Jeju April 3rd incident. And this peace war was established in 2008, uh, just after investigation has announced, and uh, they kind of come up with approximation of uh, casualty. They also found the huge uh, graveyard of collective uh, victims. So this is also interesting background. When the artists uh, began to deal with uh, this uh, historical memories of Korean War uh, during the 2000s and afterwards. Another background is that the on the right, the Hunsum Liams, and he's a documentary photography. Um, and I make it some comparison with the, the painting, more realistic painting on the left. Unlike the older generation, the younger generation of South Korean artists who actively began, began working from the 2000s, tended to uh, evade, to include more directly uh, violent or destructive images, like uh, on the left. And they kind of tended to not perceive some kind of enemy situation. Like on the left, you see this is whole the Korean people trapped in the shackles, and there's a lot of reference to the American popular culture, which is certainly constitute the contrast. Uh, I mean, this whole this is a, this painting is supposed to be really huge. What I'm trying to say, uh, the traditional uh, realist painters in South Korea tended to uh, evoke and provoke the audiences with more violent images. But on the right, as you can see, the younger generation begins to be interested in more traces and remnants of historical memory, rather than provoking the audience with more specific, didactic uh, ways. So let me begin with the table of contents. These are the five categories. And this book actually it's intended for the, the broader introduction as well. So I put first category of documentary photograph, and second is a DMZ. So it's really others who pursue the placeness of DMZ, history of DMZ, and some of the participatory artistic projects. It's like a public art. And third category is documentary films. And fourth is the media installation. And fifth, is the exhibitions and museums, especially war museums or war memorials. So these are the different categories that dealt with history of Korean War after uh, years, years of uh, uh, tragic events had happened. On the left is Hong Sun Liam and, and his stone, Blonde the Rocks, and the right is the nameless scenery. I will say the gradual Denise of military dictatorship and conservative government in South Korea, most importantly, Committee of Reconciliation, that uh, come up with a more direct uh, historical investigation. And I wrote an article on three documentary photographers so dealing with the post traumatic uh, moment. The theory of late photography refers to that and the dominant tendency in documentary photography. It omits the parts of destructive images, such as the scenes of ruins after the September 11th. I mean, documentary theory becomes really popularized, particularly by the David Company, uh, the British photographic critic. Let's look at the Hunsunim's footprint in nameless scenery. Both are taken while Im was filming his work. This is after the Committee of uh, Historical and Truth acknowledge the tragic incident and try to come up with approximate number of over casualties. The government resurrected the graveyard, as I introduced you. Until then, the whereabout the victim's corpse had been unknown. Then the producer of the film, now the wife of Im, was also the victim's family, who did not know the graveyard of her uh, grandfather. During the early 2010, Jeju Island became the center of attention as the Korean government plan to establish a neighbor base. Despite the long history of violence and war, 
the island still considered as a dear place for the neighbor based by the government. It's under the Inongba administration. And there's a huge demonstration. But if you look at the left, none of the actual trace of violence seems to be evident. It's more of artist's imagination. Now, the fact that the short and deep forest is where the victims tended to flood and execute it. Uh, especially, this is the unique types of uh, uh, natural uh, uh, habitat in, in Jeju Island because it's a, the island is so windy. The, the trees are uh, it's kind of moving, growing in many different directions, and you know. Uh, making some kind of labyrinth like a forest and become, um, uh, it really become important uh, inspiration materials for a lot of Korean artists. And in fact, historically, a lot of uh, victims had to fly to this, uh, uh, this forest in order to escape from the militaries and the policemen uh, hung down and investigations during the January, April 3rd. So this is a historical too. But you can't really see what's happening. I mean, this is all imaginary. What is interesting thing about these types of traits is that it can provoke the viewer's imagination. Viewer can fill in the blanks. What he said, this is the artist's point. I'll explain that. Lives of the past are different from the lives of the present. That seems to be the only way of preventing more tragic future. Because this kind of force also become a popular tourist attraction, we say. So by taking the image of this old uh, Jeju island in a little bit darker way, he wanted to remind us that the destroyed, beautiful, uh, unique natural habitat in Jeju Island is a happens to be a historic place and tragic place in the past. Now this is another one, Wang Jin Che. And I will say it's a framing, his technique is a framing. Uh, Wang Junche took the photographs of military complexes, bunkers, and other facilities that are no longer in use. Some of them located very close to the area that people are living. You can definitely see the apartment complex in the back, close to the highway or deserted land close to the city. The historical background was the border protection law. Uh, this is an agreement between Korean government and uh, US and military uh, forces. On the one hand, the Korean government wanted to develop the northern part of uh, Gyeonggi-do, close to the you know, border area. At the same time, American military want to relocate some of the forces that very close to, to the borderline to the southern part of uh, Gyeonggi-do, like for safety and you know, uh, changes of their uh, military militaristic strategy. And the whole plan has the uh, completed, I guess, 2018. So it's almost like more than two, 20 years it took place to complete the project. And a lot of uh, American military was kind of vacated. And uh, now they're in Hyeongtaek area. It's kind of southern part of uh, Seoul. And these are the stones used to prevent the tank that get it directly heading into Seoul. So you have a lot of stones, small stones in the middle. So the, the, the huge, you know, vehicles can't really directly get into uh, the vicinity, the soul in vicinity. That had a, been used during the Korean War and the bunkers. And the other interesting historical background is certainly the real estate boom. Uh, and the government, really, original government particularly, boosted the, the northern part of the area uh, for, for the developments to build the huge apartment complexes and outlet stores. Uh, the area nearby military complexes and borderlines has been conceived as too dangerous, so the investment has been far lagging until the early 2000s. But after the 2000 and to that mid 2000, the, the 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 whole nature of this area has been really really changed. Here are the two images. One of one is on the left is Ujungbu. Ujungbu is really famous. If you go to Ujungbu. Uh, these days, you can see a lot of big apartment complexes. The apartment store is actually uh, is, is there uh, one of the biggest outlets in the Paju and, and the, uh, the northern out of the uh, Paju area, which used to be considered to be really kind of deserted and dangerous area for investment in the past. And what's interesting thing about this uh, photograph is the juxtaposition of a foreground and a background. So you can see that these remnants are very small, ignoble, yet still exist really right there in the middle of our 
in, in the middle of our apartment complexes. Finally, Su Su Yang Niu is a rare female documented photographer in South Korea. Uh, she usually took a photographs of North Korean expatriates. So she, because she was actually working as an English teacher for the schools of the children whose, whose families come from the North, what we call like Kalbucha, uh, or North Korean defectors and expatriates. Uh, I will pay attention to this particular photograph because it's collage image. Uh, she went to the Incheon Park where this very famous MacArthur statue is standing. And this young couple, I mean, I think the brother and sister, who ran into the statue and took pictures of it. And so Tarwa was certainly very, very surprised because Korean definitely not pay attention to this statue. It's one of the statues considered to be very ugly, very unpopular. It, you know, the, the city of Incheon constantly changed the locations of the statue because the younger generation is certainly not interested in it. So the photographer is really surprised that this North Korean expatriate kind of running to it, taking pictures in front of the uh, uh, MacArthur. I think it's probably because that's the that's really the historic figure that they are familiar with, while the rest of the younger generation is not really interested in MacArthur. And she uh, took a picture of the artist Yun took a picture of Dam taking pictures of MacArthur. So it's kind of combined collage image. So one area is that the uh, uh, she she took a picture of Dam. And they took a picture of statue, MacArthur. So you really wanted to see how two different perspectives coexisting toward this one historic figure, particularly the very important figure during the Korean War. So late photography in South Korea have found the new possibilities in capturing fragments of, of reality precisely by not trying to carry the full narrative of ready, incomplete, and forgotten historical materials. Task vacant military facility oftentimes just abandoned. We don't know exactly um, the purpose of it. We just assume the purpose of this defunct military facility. And Yoon's treatment of defectors refused to ex explicitly depict and define the victims of given historical materials and events. You can criticize, but uh, we can't come back with a question and answer session. But at the same time, this photographic style is thus useful, implying the layered historical circumstances for remembering, as well as, for that matter, for forgetting about historical wounds imposed for South Korean society without confining the history of violence into political rhetoric and shocking images. Because some of the Koreans are really familiar with this. You know, there's, the politics and always use this very shocking images to provoke the people, provoke the people's fear. So this is really kind of opposite strategy. And the second chapter is about the places of DMZ. While documentary photographs still uh, dealt with the Indexco marks, I will move to the site of DMZ as the symbolic place for the through our circumstances of remembrance and forgetting. The DMZ has been the major part of tourism related to the Korean War. At the same time, how the place has been used as a part of a tourist policy around the borderline area tells the very ambivalent uh, meanings of Korean War in post-war South Korean society. As you can see on the left, DMZ has been interpreted as the place for eulogized for the natural habitat and the symbol of peace. And I, if you just, I can't believe that it's in DMZ. I think that someone actually borrowed the image from Europe. You see that if you look at really closely, it's kind of European pig type of mountains. Um, I like that. Uh, uh, as you can see on the left, and then we can call it as Ecotourism, important transition from security tourism that emphasized history of militaristic conflicts in the region. I like this image, which looks like European hiking trails and famous tourist attraction. Indeed, as I have discussed in the previous section, the border protection law made the regional tourism in the DMZ area 
or prosper and you know, expedited. DMZ is the most visited place among international tourists. And the government established the Pyongha work, so the peace work and peace trail and peace park in that area. Some of the romantic comedy has, has to show this place. And I can definitely see that Yen also has this DMZ. Not anymore, but especially in the early 2010s when the peace park and the park and the trail was open. The famous drama of Inheritor's son, right? <laughs> was also shot in the one of defunct American camps, Camp Graves, the defunct American military complex. So these like popular character used in a way to boost the economy. I think Yimin also has some very interesting DMC program was so unpopular. <laughs> so it's a shutdown, but there is a definitely interaction. It's important to think about the peaceful future of Korean Peninsula as vast caption and image of DMZ. The place of DMZ is, however, is far from benign. Although the DMZ being the buffering zone is occupying neither military forces other than that for the purpose of self-protection, but there has been all kinds of conflicts. You know, the JSN, the one of the I'll use the film that dealt with the, this DMZ. This is kind of really fantastic place for, uh, for a lot of people's in their imaginations. And most importantly, however, there's a serious landmine problem because a lot of last fierce battles during the Korean War took place in just right in this area. So there's huge landmines still buried in this area. But against a such authoritative approach toward the DMZ, either the place of treasury or safe haven for animals, Artists had to put their efforts to bring their own interesting inter you know, interpretation. The annual art event, the Rear DMZ project, took place from the early 2000s. First example is uh, uh, Ha Yun Kwan's re, re artwork. She's, I think she's living in France. The work effectively conveys the dual image of DMZ. You can hear the narration based upon the envy of soldiers guarding the DMZ. On the one hand, it is beautiful and quiet. And, and narration actually tells you, but you can constantly hear the sounds of explosion. You can see the boom, boom, boom sound whenever the animals step on the landmines. The title, title 489 is originated from one expert saying that it will take uh, much more than like a war, like, such as a 489 years to get rid of all the landmines buried in DMZ. And this is just really interesting work because it looks like game. It's very clean and very serene atmosphere. And there's a narration of the soldiers guarding at the GOP. And uh, one interesting comments that, that made by the soldier is that, that they, off, they, they really enjoy this beautiful scenery, but at the same time, they should be really extremely careful just to follow the footsteps made on the ground to make sure they not step on the lane lines. So it's kind of, they themselves actually express their envious feeling. They really like, because there's nobody there, so it's really clean, but at the same time, they should be really careful on the ground. Otherwise, you don't know what's gonna happen at the next minute. And criticizing the prevailing image of DMZ, I also utilize the theory of uh, OJ's uh, anthropological space Oja is a very famous French philosopher and sociologist, emphasized the process of defining a particular place not based upon the outsider's perspective, but from the insider's perspective, namely community space. I choose a Yang Ju Cho and Ji Sun Xin's work. They collaborate with the local residency, what we call the community, if you can still believe there are some types of community in the DMZ area. For instance, Yang Ju Cho worked with the local female farmers, also serving as a tourist guide in the region. In her interview, the farmers and tourist guides talked about the serenity of the region. And yet, as you can see, the sign of danger was like, was certainly stood up there as it's kind of you know, installed everywhere, contradicting with the image of middle-aged women enjoying her outfit and fantasizing their, you know, and momentum. This is a far from being the place for happiness. Jason Shin has also collaborated with the soldiers guiding the GOP general outpost 
and left the local owner and the stationary patch makers to create the patches of Amazon plant. If someone actually go to, you know, to the military know how the young soldiers really like to collect these lot of patches. These are not official. You can look at some of them looks like a very DZ type, but these animals are um, the, uh, the, the, the animals that can be found inside the DMZ. And uh, she collaborated with the soldiers to create this image. And then it's really soluble and it's collectible. Actually, it's sold also in our museum in Seoul. So there's a lot of uh, play around with this kind of idealized image of DMZ. The final work is Minho Glin. The her Monument 300 is the it's really about participatory art project happening in the region of Chungu, very close to the DMZ. Lin worked with the rumors of area water work center. Herder Mesh Hirsch, you know, Marion Hirsch mentions that the arts and writings of the post-memory generation drew the inspiration from least reliable and secondary sources, such as rumors. And certainly, there's a rumors related to the Waterbrook Center. According to the Korean government, North Korean army camp 300 South Korean civilians. Then they tortured and killed them. But according to one victim's daughter, the civilians were adap adapted as they were mostly engineers and other professional who might be conceived as beneficial to the North Korean army. So out of a research and interview, uh, Lim, the artist, hypothesized that uh, there might be some bleeding marks kept underneath this area. So it's kind of imaginary circumstances. Upon the arrival of the site of Waterbrook Center, participants were given portable flashlights and they could make out transparent watermarks in the middle. It, I mean, this is really not really, it's very beautiful if you see from the rear uh, images, but it's still not easily recognizable. The watermarks are made of transparent epoxy and placed on the ground. In reality, however, it's almost impossible for participants to spot these small ignoble markers on the snowy back, snow ground, snowy ground in a really uh, cold weather. The term is very notorious for the cold weather. Here, what I will call uh, is to uh, the NAMI nature of finding historical traces. Even if these are fictional ones, how can such an emphasis on the process uh, opening to new potentials for the post-memory generations, the very relationship with historical tragedies. Post-memory's connection to the past remains fragmentary and secondary. Yet the achievement of younger generation rests upon the investment, projection, and creation. I borrowed this expression from Marianne Hirsch's book and their attempt to reconstruct historical tragedies. Lean's participatory project evolves on the audience's search for imagined historical evidence created by the artist himself. The first chapter deals with the photographers looking for the traces, and the second chapter deals with the artists uh, involving ordinary Koreans with the process of searching the historical marks around the DMZ. The third chapter is more directly related to the real personal tragedies and family history. Uh, particularly uh, uh, filmmakers themselves. As I mentioned earlier, one source of uh, forgetting or historical oblivion relates to the Korean War in South Korea is historical context of anti-communism. For instance, Che Hee Hong on the left, uh, my father's email revolves around her father who came from the north to the south right before the outbreak of the war. But in South, his wife's cousin was involved with Hodo Yame. It's a very notorious uh, civilian massacre. Another uh, anti-communist uh, hamda by the South Korean government during the Korean War. Since wife's cousin was sacrificed during the Hodo Yame, uh, this father of Hong Jae director was also classified as the group of uh, suspicious people by the Korean government. Thus, he has endured his entire life the surveillance and social discrimination accorded upon these suspicious people. Because he is 
he doesn't really like the North because he escaped from the North Korea, but he ended up hate South Korea too. So he wants to go to Australia, but he can't emigrate because he was considered to be suspicious people. So but uh, I will come back with the tragic circumstances of him on the left. But on the right is director Yang Yang He. Uh, the, the film Dear Pyongyang won the prizes from Sundance Film Festival and Berlin Film Festival. Yang's father was a pro-North Korean known as a Cho Chong Young, living in Japan. He sent to uh, the North Korea three older sons or three older brothers, which you can see, Yang Yang is the youngest girl in the middle, and you see three uh, uh, older brothers. As a part of the repartition project uh, in, the 19, in the early 1970s, uh, North Korean government invited the Koreans living in Japan for, uh, uh, to, to give the full citizenship, because uh, uh, as you can see, South Koreans or North Koreans Koreans living in Japan were not entitled to have the citizenship until now. So they have to really face with all kinds of social discriminations. So um, his father actually decided to send all three sons to the North. But in both circumstances, both fathers kept their silences. As I told you, uh, his father wants to leave to South Korea, but he couldn't. So he can't leave the country. But throughout all his life, he emotionally shut himself from the rest of the family. Tae Young opened the emails from her father almost the seven months after his death. So there's a lot of confusion, late information. This scene is in which uh, the Tae Hong, the, the daughter, uh, accidentally spot his, uh, his, his fa her father's luggage, but definitely she couldn't open it. So on the way to the locksmith, it just automatically opened. But that was kind of a symbolic way of the relationship between a uh, father and daughter. Uh, thus, the documentary deals with the home's process of tracking down his father's life, uh, his inner minds, not limiting itself to find the factual account of his life. But there's also a lot of uh, uh, incidents where she really expressed the frustration in the same way, Yang's father rarely reveals his inner minds to the daughter. Any problematic opinion might jeopardize the safety of his sons in the North. He kept a picture of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il throughout his life in his house. He never answered Yang's question whether he regretted of sending his three sons to the North. Of course, if you look at the documentary, three sons are terribly, terribly unhappy. And one of the sons died uh, due to the depressions, but all oh, of that really looks really unhappy. And one of the recurring dominant images were his back shot from behind. Yang's father passed away while she was filming, and he was not able to say at the later part of the film due to her disease, but the, there's a lot of moments that he never, never answered the question. This is a long story. Therefore, my father's emails, dear Pyongyang, shows the process through which the past memory generation investigates a nation's tragedy through their personal history. And both films reveal a post memory generation's frustration over, uh, over the, the lack of communication with the older generation. And the films really dealt with not just the father, but more about these filmmakers, the daughter's ways of coming to terms with the tragic experience of his father's generation. And the ending was also tragic in a way in both films because the, in Hong Jae, uh, the father was really had a terrible relationship with the rest of the family and the rest of the family you know, deny and doesn't want to reconcile his father. According to Hirsch, the mechanism of post-memory is predicated upon the delay and gap between historical memories and artifacts, which emerged as a key trait of the post-memory generation's artworks. Indeed, both uh, my father's emails and Dio Pyongyang proves how difficult and confusing and limited the process of reconciliation between the first generation and the generations after the war uh, might be. While uh, emotional aspects of family treasury were large, the next chapters would deal with the really emotional, affected memories. 
how artists can emotionally provoke the post memory generation audiences, how the non visual elements of the senses, such as sounds and smells, can be used to achieve such effects. Uh, the first one is Changju An. Work with the sounds. Specifically, he used the sounds from the war movies, like a type of giving in the old blocks versus the movies, because he wouldn't have exact sounds of wars during the Korean War. So he made up. Uh, out of whole, what we call the secondary sources. And then he helped the dancers, all wearing the very contemporary clothing, to dance, uh, listen to these sounds first, and then perform while imagining the last moments of those victims during the war. Your first one is a huge sound of us. Audience can hear this very huge banging sound before they standing in front of this uh, horizontal expand the screen. I mean, usually the scale is really huge and very overwhelming. And the other thing is, uh, uh, there's a really individual interpretation. Uh, uh, different, they're really different from each other. One female dancer is just circling around. The other, uh, the male kind of tended to make some narrative, like, you know, you know the, Initially, the Tom Dren explained that some people really wanted to follow some Hollywood like arc. Like, you know, it's like, you know, you know it's just showing their love of the family. So there's a really different interpretations of this last moment. In the same way, so it's kind of post memory, in, imagine an investment. In the same way, Taylor Lee used the voice of narrator to read the letters of student soldiers, which is currently in the collection of National War Memorials at Yongsan. Let me read this. There are many. This is a letter written by 13 and 14 year old student soldiers. There are many. We are only 71 people. I'm afraid what is going to happen. I feel a little calm because I feel I'm talking to you, Mom. I want to go back to you when the war is over. And call you mom. It's really heartbreaking. As the letter was found inside his corpse, found the next day of his death. While the narrator reads the letter, he wrote electronic equipment, which records the fluctuation of his brain waves. He was this voice narrator, it's just a contemporary figure. He was a cry in the climactic moment of the graphic lines. Uh, definitely rapidly fluctuating. According to the Chinese critic Xiang Xin, Taylor Lee's work treats his narrators and put them out in the audiences as not only subject who express emotions, but also object being measured and observed. Because really we observing him, the voice narrator, actually find changing the voice and express and sometimes overwhelm by emotions. In emphatic audition, the scan images of narrator's brain on the screen help the audience witness how the narrator's brains and bodies react to emotional stimuli. The last work from this chapter is Taeyeon Park. Its installation of uh, H. Cheese Barber Shop used the smell, or properly speaking, the over a smell, enclosed atmosphere, and mumbling sounds. Used the creams and other chemical materials, object belonging to the older generation to create an atmosphere that reminds the generations of war veterans. Here, part introduced smells, not just to represent a particular message, but also to construct the atmosphere that can use sense to disturb the audiences because it's really stuffy. It's uh, made of the small boxes. The unfamiliar uh, and a stuffy smell of the atmosphere inside the H.E.'s barber shop may be made foreign to some young visitors. The exhibitions also took place in 2017, the height of the protest calling for the step down of the present Park Geunebra, the symbol of older generation history. If you know some of the Hegeki Bude, you can find everything on the right. And it's taking the exhibition take to place at the Seoul Sema Seoul Museum of Art, which is very close to the Kwanam. So it's, you can't it's you can't miss it. And um, so the symbol of older generation history and nostalgia, thus uncomfortable atmosphere, the technically located inside the barber shop, and old men's mumbling. And did you see the screen and old man's mumbling is really referenced back to the student soldier, his ears and the student soldier resonate with the marginalized social and political conditions of the older generation, especially 
in the minds of younger generations of South Koreans visiting the exhibition. And so it's not really what I'm saying, it's not representative. You, you not, it may not really uh, represent the smells of the war. It's more like evocative, provoke the audiences to think about it, what really happened, what kind of distance, generation of difference means to them, how the uncomfortable the smells atmosphere is. In the final chapter, I look into the cases, three cases of artists organized visions. This chapter deals with Undi Sorji's body and missing corpse sacrificed during the Korean War as a new site or a material, material new subject to rethink about the, to rethink about the traditional memorials and exhibitions at war museum. Hong Sun Im's homecoming box was the rare example dealing with the Korean soldiers coming back from the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, the South Korea sent the second biggest troops to the Vietnam War next to the US. But during the early 2000s, repressive history of South Korean soldiers, violent deeds uh, at the Vietnam War has, has covered by Han Gyeri and uh, the Kim Dae Jung president has a uh, apologize for it, but, and then there's a lot of controversy surrounding the Vietnam War veterans uh, in South Korea. At the same time, the uh, veterans also pose problems with the defoliant Asian orange because of the, a lot of the, the problem with the skin disease and everything. Hong Soo Nim's homecoming boxes organized at this complicated time for Korean veterans of Vietnam War. And you can see those images. Uh, let me read what the artist says. Rather than the letters appear on the surface of celluloid plate, the letters recorded on the underneath the photograph can be closer to the truthfulness of memory. So you kind of get into the personal uh, and, and material culture of these veterans that have not been really explored until then. And particularly, we have to pay attention to this image. I can show you the on the right and the middle, the soldier lost one leg. It's really uncommon to reveal the, the wounded body in public. Therefore, the, uh, uh, I can read this very shocking uh, reference. This is the interview, a short dream of K. This is Mr. K who lost a leg. That's about the physical things like legs because I have only one leg. Well, what should I say? In my dream, I have both legs and just went somewhere, something like that. When I walk up, I found myself having only one leg. After awaking, all was in vain, for it's just a daydream and became concerned about my real life. What's interesting thing is he made it in public. That's a really rare thing. Erica Dawes has claimed that it's not uncommon to expose the image of disabled sources in public. Official depiction of war heroes in memorials consciously avoids revealing the pathological uh, state of these soldiers. The last image is uh, from the exhibition the, uh, at the National Museum of Korean History. The special exhibition, Bring Them Home, or in Korean, Returning Home in 67 Years, at the National Museum of Korean History, further calls our attention to the new way of repressing, representing death, that is to reveal absent and vacant burial pits and to attract the public's attention to the forgotten and obscured issues of missing corps in South Korea. Uh, there's a whole history, but uh, the total number of casualties of South Korean sources reaches more than 130,000, but less than 1% of missing corps had been found so far. And there's a whole list of it, but so far, 142 bodies have been identified and returned to the uh, National Cemetery. It's a very low uh, percentage. But on the top of it, the family rarely report their DNA. Uh, a, because they don't think you know, it's possible, but B, they have a long history of doubt that whenever they found spotted the corpse in some weird area, you know, they can consider it to be betrayer, deserter, or pro-communist, etc. So it's got very, very low, uh, very, very uh, uh, tragic circumstances. Returning to the exhibition, uh, the ground pit at the Bring Them Home appears as a kind of theater 
the which the audience can imagine the complicated historical social context behind the absent bodies. Along with the constructed T on the right, the audience can also see the military ID tags and necklaces. I mean, you can't, I mean, there's a lot of materials you can find it, but they can't find the body, basically. Uh, in Bring Them Home, the lead light delineating the silhouette of imaginary dead body of the soldier into the plastic cast of the corpse shaped object. And this is a blinking inside the constructed T, uh, where the body is supposed to be buried. The LED sign in a way revokes the fact that the body is absent as the lightning is consistently flickering, yet never appears to be permanent and stable. At the same time, the various site that emphasize the absence of that body remind the audience of the shifted role of memorials. According to the young James Young, very famous anthropologist, uh, the new generations of artists and architects have preferred to take amorphous shapes that emphasize the openness in an increasingly democratic age in which the stories of uh, nations are being told in the multiple voices of its everyday historian, its individual citizens' monolithic meanings and national narrative are as difficult to pin down as they may be nostalgically known for. Reserved has been a shift away from the notion of national collective memory to what I call the nation's collective memory. So many different memories existing. Therefore, I argue the contemporary arts and forms of the last two decades have shown how the Korean War has been used not so much to recover the forgotten historical facts alone, but also to see how those traces have been repressed or uh, somewhat deliberately forced or sometimes abandoned, uh, such as military bunkers, ecotourism, uh, DMZ, by different uh, social groups. While these images might not directly portray or show the violent history of Korean War, they demonstrate how post fast Korean society and people has dealt with the memory of Korean War, as well as, despite all this historical oblivion, its continued process, presence in contemporary Korean society. All right, so we have, um, we already received three questions um, via Zoom. So we'll cover that, but we will also take questions from the audience here in the room. Um, so, what, um, okay, uh, any questions from the audience? I guess because I know you have to leave, so yeah. Uh, when you, uh, could you please identify yourself when you're asking questions? Thank you. Yeah, I'm Jung Shu Lee, and actually I'm teaching um, Korean art and then the East Asian art at Chitori. So I thank you so much for your very informative and inspirational artists. All these artists are amazing. Art. So my question is, so you said, it seems like these artists might be the second generation, the middle generation. And then um, I'm just curious about the resources I mean, where they uh, encounter all this, you know, even though that's very kind of secondary, you know, secondhand information, but maybe there is a, like a war museum or national history museums and things like, or maybe direct from their grand grandparents. Um, so all these divers, I mean, maybe you did an interview with an artist. So how, how deeply they could um, receive our influence so that they can do um, creative you know, injection and production you know, to create this work. That's my first question. The second question is, very interested in um, government petition for that. Because as far as I know, the war related work of art were not exhibited that much until very recently, until Moon's uh, president you know, National Gallery of War had a big uh, mega exhibition about the Korean War. So what about the, um, like, is there any kind of mega exhibition about that? What about the government support about this the circulation of the images and resources? Thank you. Answer to the first question is that I'm not really close to these artists. I've been actually working with these artists years and years more than, some of them are actually, are very close friends of mine more than 10 years. Uh, ironically, they research a lot. 
they research a lot. So I'm actually talking about the distance because there's a post-memory generation. Uh, that means their memories and their encounter is a secondary, but at the same time, they work a lot. For instance, Hung Sun Ming visit the military archives in the U.S. I mean, all over the world to check out old photographs. But rather than taking images directly or borrowing images from this military archive, he, he, he kind of went into this uh, interviews. Because I saw, I showed just the photographs, but he was documentary filmmakers. And also he published a lot of photographs as a part of photographic books. It shows his process of research, so they know a lot. Uh, number two is that, for instance, the Weir DMZ project. Uh, in order to participate this yearly, it's very important. It becomes prestigious <laughs> our event in South Korea. You have to get through the process of art, artist residency. So they have to meet with the uh, local historian. Uh, they also has a architectural historian. So they get to know about this history actually better than the ordinary uh, people as well as our ordinary community of artists. So there's a distance, but also that put a lot of efforts. What I'm trying to say through this research, they're not just to uh, just, just represent what they know about it. It's more like they kind of become more critical and as well perceptive in, in de deconstructing. And we got the history of Waterworks Center in Luna. And then he kind of went into the family directly, get the oral history to the sideway of the official information they can get. And then they went on to uh, the relationship with the family, make up the story. So there's a additional efforts. And I really like this uh, imagining investment. I mean, what it is a creative process, which is only possible in the fields of art. You can't do it as a historian, right? The rumors are a fun thing. Um, so that's the on and on. That's just something that I can talk about it. Uh, answer to your second question. It, it's a. Uh, I think it's uh, it's not necessarily government uh, takes particular position these days. Uh, Korean art world, the Korean society at least becomes sophisticated. I mean, at least pretends to be sophisticated. Uh, in other words, Koreans are really self, you know, very control their own uh, opinions before the governments actually get in the way. So in a way, the Korean artists also give some self-censorship. That's more like important concept you have to think about it before saying government doesn't want this or a kind of interrupt. That's not gonna be happening so much. The artists just not let that happen. But like a lot of the South Korean people, still Korean artists also uh, not going so deep. So they wanted to play around a lot of concept that is unlawful. But, uh, but also the other thing about the, uh, the recent exhibition in commemoration of the break of the Korean War, uh, it's like an MMCA exhibition in the National Museum and also the other exhibitions and Pyongyang exhibitions where the Taeyong Park's installations appear. Um, that's actually both exhibitions under the you know, more progressive government. I'm kind of take the critical position for either conservative and progressive government. I don't think the progressive government is more open to, uh, to, to deal directly deal with the tragic history. I think the governments are pretty much the same. I'm not trying to include so tragic image in the art museum. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's on and on. There's a differences between art museum and history museum, but obviously uh, it's more likely the Korean uh, government or the artists trying to not really stick on the really controversial images. That's also his you know, this, the cultural atmosphere there too. So I don't, I don't want to say that any government really, really brave enough to stop or step into area. And that's what I think about even the, the politicians, progressive intellectuals are a little bit hypocritic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's very, it's interesting uh, to learn that. I mean, uh, either liberal or conservative uh, governments are, are you know, all like trying not yeah. to um, portray these tragic images of the Korean War. Um, because, because the especially uh, progressive government uh, kind of vague about it. For instance, we see the ecotourism because they don't want to kind of provoke North Korea to 
So in a way, they have the own position of not doing it. In the same way, conservative government also do not doing it because their own position for domestic, you know, very conservative borders. Right? I mean, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so let me ask a question from uh, online. So this is a question from Alvina. What was the turning point catalyst for South Korea to turn the remnants of the Korean War into tourist attraction art? It's understandable that Korea shouldn't be held back by the events of the war, but what enabled them to turn this one once painful event into a source of something greater in such a short time? Yes, I mean, it's, I'm not that much like a historian of the uh, uh, diplomatic or political controversy related to the, the presentation of the uh, Korean War, but I can say overall, uh, because Korean, uh, even back to the Lotte uh, administration, which kind of began to prepare for the border protection law, they wanted to have a good relationship with China first. So this is all, you know, think about it. I mean, so they always care about the relationship with China and North Korea, despite the fact that the conservative politicians um, kind of very mantras about uh, their relationship with North Korea. In the end, I don't think they are really that much because you have to deal with the whole, uh, uh, the, the dynamics within the region. So I will say once South Korea become more conscious about the uh, Korean's economy relations with China, I mean, the broader sense, as far as understanding, I mean, it's really, really, really difficult issues. Nobody can really answer it, but Based upon my reading, that kind of beginning uh, of uh, South Korean government trying to be kind of work with the communist government and never really uh, doing it for totally uh, a diplomatic, the militaristic uh, concerns. I think then the government is actually fluctuating. But the interesting thing is that either Kim and Bok administration and the Nomuyan administration both wanted to get a lot of investors to the northern part of Gyeonggi-do, because the Gyeonggi-do is the second largest area for the population in South Korea. And that's a very limited area in the southern part of Seoul. You have a Pundang in your area, which is really stark, stark contrast with the, some of the economic conditions in the region during the early 2000s. So they really kind of try to brought, uh, bring a lot of investors to the northern part of so, so there's also uh, domestic economy concerns. So I think it's combined. So they're pretending they're really against North and China, but in the economic sense, in reality, I think they have to kind of play around with these images, not to, not to, you know, to make, yeah. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you. Um, so it's kind of related to what you just mentioned. Uh, it sounded like the, the change we see in the, like how people appreciate the Korean War is more kind of shaped by the government policy rather than like, how people think differently about like older generations. So do you think, so you mentioned like the government have different policies about how they uh, view China or North Korea and that's like has some like uh, work towards kind of regulations to like, what kind of work can be in the like museum and so on. So do you think we'll see like government policy like driving the kind of move towards more neutral uh, representation of the Korean War? Or do you think there's like kind of underlying, underlying like, change uh, in terms of how people see the Korean War? Uh, because I have to talk about the government's role. Uh, in the end, this whole uh, information related to historical treasuries or like, you know, some information in DMZ. It's, it used to be the part of uh, uh, military information so that it's not the information in the private sector. Uh, for instance, like uh, some of the areas uh, that becomes a part of the peace park or peace trail used to belong to the military area. It's not forbidden. So, I, I think the military or the, the government has to play important roles. 
to let these area occupied by some artistic events or the artist who can access this information. That's the first level of government in a the role, not necessarily intervention, but also uh, this uh, anti-communist textbook or materials, it's really common to the generations of this uh, uh, people, the artists who, were, who grew up in 1987. So there's a government uh, uh, role. But I'm not saying governments ask you, uh, the artists to do this and do that. It's not really happened for a long time. You know, people's artists actually constantly protested against. So this, uh, uh, if that happens, it becomes really controversial. If it's the government, or it's not a government, it's the government officials or some curators of the private, the public institution ask the artists to redo certain work. We call it censorship. Then the artists really protest. It's not going to be. It's not that happens so frequently, but as I told you, uh, maybe artists themselves become careful of not to deal with a certain things. For instance, North Korean flag is now a lot in public, but artists had a lot of artworks dealing with North Korean flags. But sometimes they cover it on the opening day. <laughs> And then, you know, in the in the non-profit small art gallery, definitely they exhibit it. But in a public place, they refrain it or they just get rid of it from the scenes. I mean, so they're doing it. So that's a, I'm not so sure it's governmental interventions, but there's a something into it. I mean, it's, 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 it's also part of the Korean society because uh, uh, the government has actually give a lot of money. Uh, for artists to produce works and have an exhibition and, uh, and the public museums participate in international biennials with the public money. Uh, it's not censorship in a direct way, but if somebody in Korea know it, uh, they don't like it and gradually they're not the part of the community. So, so the Korean artist is now as a how to deal with the circumstances. So yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's one example. Right, thank you. Um, now, next we have a question from Hyunjae Kim. Uh, he's a, a student studying heritage and memory uh, in UK. Uh, it's a question about the scope um, uh, that you apply the concept of post-memory. So it seems that the concept of post-memory is generally about visual arts and writings of familiar connections or kinships of the Holocaust survivors. But I'm very impressed with your study to deal with wider scope of people who remember the Korean War. Could you share your insight of how the concept of post-memory can be dealt with by the wider groups rather than only descendants of the survivors? Who do you think the generation of post-memory in terms of the Korean War? There might be possible discussions about this. Right. Um, let me introduce the most recent paper and the project that I did. I wrote about Jane Jin Kazan's. Uh, Jane Jin Kazan was a uh, representative artist for Chris, uh, the Korean by, uh, by, uh, pavilion at Venice Biennial two years before. And she was at the of Denmark. Uh, what's interesting thing is that she, of course, come back to Jeju Island, where she spoke, she was believed to be uh, 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 the part of it. And then she later tracked down and found out that her grandfather was a victim of Jeju April 3rd massacre. So there's a lot of interesting things going on. I, and I joked about the Hirsch never write about the post memorial generation interaction and through the concept of shaman, because uh, her grandfather was a shaman himself, was a male shaman. So uh, uh, the, the shaman, the, the, the student of her grandfather, uh, do, did the ritual through which this artist, who was, was raised in Denmark for, for, for decades and decades, come back in her 30s to meet her grandfather, through this uh, shamanistic ritual. So obviously there's kind of a geographical expansion uh, in terms of dia diaspora. Uh, 
The other thing is that I think the, uh, unlike the Holocaust, the Korean War is something that is still going on. Because it's a really not necessarily we are having war all the time, but any coverage related to there's a small tiny bit conflict here and there. Uh, it's a part of our history. So unlike the Holocaust, maybe the Korean War, uh, the memories of Korean War is, is continue part of a post-war Korean life. So there's another interesting aspect of uh, uh, the scope of a post-memory generation and the idea of inherited memory. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Son Ho Kim. I am a first year student at this school. I'm part of the MAIA program, Summer Art International Fair. Um, my question is as far as I remember, recall when I was a middle school student, uh, one of our um, school mission or school trip was to go to the DMZ and um, see what's going on there and learn about the history. And the main, if I remember correctly, the main purpose of it is to remember what happened back in the day and also for the future unification, like any potential unification. And also, I think. Uh, the, uh, I think the main purpose of the trip was like that. And also I remember on the TV, we kept uh, seeing the um, the meeting, arranged meeting between North, uh, between the se separated uh, family in the Korean mm -hmm. War. Yeah. So that was kind of helping me to understand the emotional involvement between the families. But nowadays I'm curious, like how people even get involved emotionally um, in this Korean post-Korean war situation. And I'm curious if there is any activity going on in middle school or high school student or that because I think to remember those tragedy, tragedy, um, I think those kind of activity has to be done in a way, like not even, not only like you know, go there and see actually what happened there. But um, I think part of it is um, having this art exhibition about it. But I'm just curious what, what's going on there, because I don't know. Right, right. I don't know anything about what kind of education they'll get. But obviously, Jisoo Ki might be, you know, for my generations, uh, of course, the younger generations in South Korea no longer should uh, read uh, the books about ideology. Uh, during the summer break to write reviews like you know review and stuff they no longer has to do that if you read a book uh there's a research saying that uh, uh among the high school students or middle school students uh, uh only small percentage like a 30 to 20 percentage you have to read a book i can't remember exact uh, data uh only a really small fraction like 20 30 percent actually last thing uh, remember, knows the when Korean War broke out. So zero, their knowledge is actually zero and the situation is more uh, uh, moving to that direction. And as I told you, I was involved with the younger generations of artists collective called the Tundan Image Center. Uh, that means a center for divided image. And one of their ideas is, is that the obsession with unification is wrong term. Uh, that's not going to be happening. North and South Korea is a separate nation. So the, they consider the North Korea is no longer enemy. I think it's, it's pretty much uh, strong among the younger generations. I don't know the personal memories or personal reaction to it. I think it's more likely moving into that direction. Uh, so that's why I choose the second generation because the, the generations of artists and who were grown up with this memory of uh, democratization movement and, and very uh, a brainwashed sort of anti-communist education materials tended to be more interested in historical representation compared to the younger generation who wants to do in a very different way. They, they, you know, they're kind of more deconstructing. Sometimes it's very, it can be more problematic too sometimes because they don't know the history at all. But let's see what will happen. But definitely there are changes. Yeah. 
I mean, which we all know that the younger generation is not really interested in unification because it's a two different nation anyway, and why you should unify them. Actually, I have a related question related to emotional aspect because I'm very much interested in this um, uh, emotions and affect. And uh, I notice you have a chapter on affective memory, which I find it to be you know, really interesting. So I appreciate how you're not just looking at visual images, but also this, you know, um, the uh, affect aspect of memory as well, or the construction, reconstruction of memory through affect. Um, what do you, so what impact do you think uh, this, you know, um, affect has in or reconstructing the memory of the Korean War. Uh, so I'm just curious as to what's your take on this. So for example, it's just simply, uh, you know, inherited memory versus affect memory, affective memory. Uh, what different impact do you think it has? Uh, there, there are many different things. So I didn't really respond to the Isang Gajo, but uh, in Minu, who did some participatory project in the second chapter, right, the Monument 300, she actually did the series of uh, projects for Isan Gacho before this work. So uh, there's just something about it. And then um, my, I was interested in Taehyung because she, I mean, the box and stuffy smells and with the Taeguki Buddha thing, because it's not so much just directly related to the Korean War, but this whole combination of Taeguki Buddha, who happens to be like one, four, and five generation, they have a very strong and, and, you know, antipathy toward North Korea because they know they are the North Korea's enemy. And then you have this very generations of young people who's not interested, you know, who's less interested in the Korean War, but also don't like, you know, doesn't like the Taeguki Buddha. So this is what I'm saying is effective thing. I don't know how to say about in an emotional way because I'm not in Thailand. I'm not a psychologist. You know, I can't really prove anything. You know, <laughs> but I'm saying is this effective thing really kind of opens up the horizon to deal with very contemporary issues. That's what I really like about the Tian Park's work. It's about Korean War because all materials are related to the Korean War. But it's a timing. And uh, so the effective emotional reaction, uh, it's not just about sadness. It's really about how to shape the people. Because in South Korea, especially younger generation, the whole idea is I don't want to disturb by this conflict. So that's also the thing. I don't want to be involved with this idea. But suddenly, something Korean wars and Taeguki, image of Taeguki, and as well as the Songjuki is an American flag. It's not just about the older generation. It's really about the war, division, diplomatic conflicts, and how the older generation use the current political discourse in relation to, uh, uh, to their own different understanding of Korean history, Korean war. Because in the end, uh, either like, really informed or uninformed, just the emotional reaction to the history of Korean War is related to the how each generation think about identity of Korea too. So you know that's my take. I, I'm not so sure about the, how much I kind of get into affected to in, in terms of psychology, human you know brain. It's, it's not that much my field. It's more like a humanities studies person. So I really like that people's really touches upon it too. That's why I'm interested. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more. Is there any question from the audience? Okay, if not, I think we'll take from um, uh, Zoom. So a question from Sophia Han. Do you think this art remembering the Korean War changes the way different generations of South Koreans view North Korea as well as South Korean relations? with North Korea, and if so, in what way? I will say it's more likely the reflection of each generation rather than changing. But at least, for instance, uh, through this art exhibition, and it was an artist talk, which is happening in South Korea, uh, the, the generational 
differences can't be understood because we rarely talk about Korean War and how they think differently. But I, I visit the Pundan Energy Center and I begin to interact with the younger generations. So it's not really changing each one's perspective, but at least to know better. So it's really kind of important platform for discussions, but I don't know exactly how it will change because it's also in the end about diplomatic militaristic conditions. Whenever we talk about Korean War, it's like it's, it's up to the whole, you know, militaristic uh, conditions. So it's a, so it's, it's a good platform for conversation because it's really, uh, sometimes it's really frustrating. Because, you know, the Korean didn't sign up uh, for the truce agreement. So the, the way, uh, come up way of uh, annulling or changing the set of truce is not between South Korea and North Korea. It's between uh, other countries like China and North Korea and the US who really signed up the treaty. That's another really interesting thing about South Korea being constantly being very frustrated. Yeah, that's what the intellectuals often say. We really awkward situation that we can't make any decisions about our destiny. So that's another thing you have to consider. So thank you so much. Um, we are out of time. So sorry, um, I we could not address all the questions asked online. But I I for, uh, but I I hope uh, you know our audience enjoyed. Uh, our Q and A session. I forgot to mention at the beginning, but uh, I today uh, Dr. Sandra Park was supposed to be moderating this talk, but uh, she wasn't feeling well, um, and so she couldn't make it today. So, but I want to thank her for volunteering to uh, moderate this talk with uh, Dr. Ko. She's also she's uh, Korea, uh, the Korean War uh, expert, so that's one of the reasons why she was going to be moderating. But anyways. I'm sure you know you enjoy the presentation today. Please join me in thanking Dr. Ko. Thanks to those of you who came in person uh, and hope to see you in our future events. And also thank you so much for our audience who joined online. Uh, we have another talk coming up this Wednesday by Professor Kyo Shin from Stanford. Uh, so hopefully um, you'll be able to make it. Thank you.